Hello, everyone. Please be seated. Okay, right. Good afternoon again. It's great to have you here. I would like to give an introduction to our distinguished speaker today, and then I will give the floor to Professor Mishala. So I'm very honored and very humbled and very nervous about introducing our today's speaker, Dr. John Mearsheimer. His credentials are very well known, but I still repeat some of them just for the sake of those who maybe have not recently checked them on the internet. John Mearsheimer is our Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1984. He attended American Military Academy at West Point between 1966 and 1970, and upon graduation he served for several years as an officer in the U.S. Air Force. He earned his master's degree in international relations from the University of Southern California, and his PhD from Cornell University. Before joining the faculty of the University of Chicago, he worked as a research fellow in Brookings Institution and at Harvard University. In 2003, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is the US oldest and most prestigious honorary societies. Professor Mirsham has written scores of influential articles, opinion pieces, and of course, a number of highly influential books to include Conventional Deterrence, the Tragedy of Great Power Politics, the Israel Lobby and the U.S. Foreign Policy, and the latest one, Why Leaders Lie, The Truth About Lying in International Politics. Professor Mearsheimer is the giant within the political science community. He is not only closely associated with the tradition of political realism, the theory of international relations, he is also the most revered authority within this school of thought. He is often referred to as Mr. Realism. His views regarding states' behavior and the nature of the international system are very well known and worthy of our most serious consideration. He's one of the most sought after speakers on the issues of American foreign policy, as not only he is candid, insightful, and entertaining, but also very provocative. Professor Mishram is not only the most influential theorist, or one of the most influential theorists in IR of the 20th and 21st century, he's also one of the most influential voices on perspectives and assumptions regarding the current foreign policy of the United States and the public debate in the US regarding the US-China relations, the Ukraine crisis, and the current situation in the Middle East. I'm sure that this series of talks to take place in the Gimo University this week will give us much to ponder and discuss. So without further ado, I please ask you to welcome Professor Mirsheimer. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Andre. Thank you all for coming out to hear me speak today. It's a great pleasure to be here at Megimo University and just to be here in Russia, which is actually my first visit, as hard as that may be to believe. Uh, the subject I'm going to talk about today is the rise of China. And to be more specific, I'm going to ask the simple question, can China rise peacefully? Uh, but before I start my talk, before I get into the substance of the talk, I want to make two preliminary remarks. Uh, the first is that I am simply assuming that China will continue to grow at an impressive rate. I often say when I lecture on this subject, there are really two big questions. One, will China continue to grow? And number two, if China does continue to grow, can it grow peacefully? Can it rise peacefully? I'm obviously going to answer the second question, but with regard to the first question, I am simply assuming that China will continue to grow. And as will become clear, at least by the end of my talk, I hope China doesn't continue to grow. Uh, my second point is that to answer the question of whether or not China can rise peacefully, you need a theory. It is essentially a theoretical question. 
And the reason is we have no facts about the future because the future hasn't happened yet. So anybody who wants to throw his or her opinion into this debate about whether China can rise peacefully can only do it with a theory. Now this is not to say that you have to agree with my theory, right? You can have a different theory and I can tell you all sorts of stories about how people respond in China and outside China to my talk and how they use other theories to combat me and that's fine. But it is important for you to understand that this is essentially a theoretical question. You need a theory in your head about great power politics to answer the question on the table. Okay, those are my two preliminary comments. Now my talk proceeds in three parts. As you would expect, given what I just said, I'm gonna lay out for you my theory of international politics. Okay, that's number one. Then number two, I'm gonna give you a short version of American foreign policy since 1783 when we gained our independence. And what I want to do in giving you that short description of American foreign policy is convince you that the Americans have behaved according to my theory. Okay? Because I want to give you confidence that my theory has explanatory power. No theory is perfect, but it is important that a theory be able to describe big cases. So the second part of my talk is about American foreign policy from 1783 up until the present. And again, I'm going to make the argument that the United States has basically behaved according to my realist theory, which is the first part of my talk. Then the third part of my talk is I'm going to talk about how China is likely to behave if it continues to grow. And of course, my argument is that China will imitate the United States. The basic argument that I'm going to make is that China will try to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. And in a sense, what I'm saying is that China will also act according to my theory. Because China imitating the United States, if the United States acts according to my theory, everything fits together very neatly. And that makes me very happy. Okay? So those are the three parts. Oh, by the way, when I talk about China rising and what China will do, I will also talk about how the United States and China's neighbors, neighbors will respond to China's rise. Okay? And of course, when I talk about how the United States will behave, in the face of China's rise, it should be consistent with the second part of my story, which has to deal with American foreign policy from 1783 up to the present. Okay, let's start with the theory. As many of you know, I start with five simple assumptions about the international system. I'm a structural realist. I believe that the structure of the system, the way the international system is organized, its architecture, determines, not completely, but in large part, how states behave. Whether you're a Russian, whether you're Chinese, whether you're American, you just have to do certain things because we all operate in the same system. So this system has five characteristics. And you take those five characteristics and you put them together and you get certain forms of behavior. That's my story. So let me lay out the five characteristics, or what I sometimes call the five assumptions. The first, which you all know about, is that the system is anarchic. Anarchic means there's no higher authority that sits above states. The opposite of anarchy is hierarchy. In English, anarchy sometimes means murder and mayhem, killing, wild and crazy, goings on. That's not what anarchy means here. Anarchy simply means that there's no higher authority in the system. In effect, the system is comprised of states that are like pool balls on a table. Some of those pool balls are bigger than the others, but nevertheless, they're all just pool balls with no higher authority. It's an anarchic system. The second assumption is that all states 
have some offensive military capability. Uh, this is not to say that all states have lots of offensive military capability, but the truth is a country like Guatemala, a country like Mongolia, a country like Thailand, a country like Belgium, it has some offensive military capability. But that's nothing compared to, say, the United States, Russia, France, Britain, Israel. These are countries that have a lot of military capability. But all states have some military capability. Okay? The third assumption, which is of enormous importance, has to do with intentions. Okay? Remember, the second assumption had to do with capabilities, and the third assumption has to do with intentions. And whenever you look at another state, what you always want to know is what are its capabilities and what are its intentions. So the third assumption has to do with intentions. And the assumption there is that you can never know for certain the intentions of another state. Now, why is that the case? It's because intentions are inside people's heads. And you can't see them, and you can't measure them. Capabilities are very different. Capabilities are material things. They're material entities that you can see, and you can count, and you can assess. Let me give you an example. When I was your age, the Cold War was going on. I, being an American, spent a lot of time thinking about the Soviet Union. And we used to pay a lot of attention to Soviet capabilities and Soviet intentions. It was never difficult in an era of spy satellites to figure out what kind of capabilities the Soviets had. We could count how many armored division equivalents they had. We could count how many SS-18s they had. We knew how many MIRVs they had on their SS-18s. We could count how many aircraft carriers, how many attack submarines. It was never difficult to figure out what Soviet capabilities were in any meaningful way. Soviet intentions, we had huge debates, which continue to this day, about whether the Soviet Union was a highly aggressive state, a status quo state, or what have you. Who knew what was in the head of Nikita Khrushchev? Who knew what was in the head of Brezhnev? Who knew had, who had his ear? Who knew who the three or four people were at the table with, who decided what Soviet foreign policy really was? We could never reach agreement. So there was always uncertainty about intentions. Now, there's some people say, John, you exaggerate. You can tell intentions of leaders today. You can listen to what they say. You can watch what they do, dot, dot, dot. I have all sorts of counter arguments to knock that down. But let's assume they're correct. My response to that is to say that even if you believe that you can know the intentions of states today, there's no way you can know the intentions of another state in the future. Because you don't even know who's going to be running China in the year 2020? Who's going to be running Russia in the year 2025? Who's going to be running the United <laughs> States in 2030? In fact, if you think of it, one of you, one of you may be running this place 25 years from now. And who knows what your intentions will be? So you can never know future intentions. The best way to highlight this is to use an example that has nothing to do with international relations and has to do with the subject of marriage and divorce. Anytime two people get married, they inevitably think that the person that they're marrying is wonderful and that the two of them are going to live happily ever after. But as you know, in the Western world and in places like Russia, there's a very high level of divorce. That means a lot of people ended up marrying someone who they thought would have benign intentions towards them forever, but did not. It's very depressing to think about this. <laughs> but if you get married, the truth is you can never be absolutely certain that the person you're marrying will not turn out to be Attila the Hun really depressing, but you can never be certain. This gets at the essence of the problem of uncertainty about intentions.
So I've given you three assumptions. One, the system is comprised of states and it's anarchic. Very simple. Second, all states have some offensive military capability, some more than others. Number three, you cannot be certain about the intentions of other states. I didn't say you could be certain that other states would have bad intentions. The starting assumption is you just can't be certain whether they'll be good or bad. Fourth and fifth assumptions are very simple. The fourth assumption is that the principal goal, not the only goal, the principal goal of states is survival. And the reason that survival is the principal goal is that if you don't survive, you can't pursue any of the other goals. <laughs> Go read Hobbes' Leviathan, right? Hobbes tells you the one thing everybody agrees on in the state of nature is that survival is the number one goal, right? You gotta survive, because you can't pursue the other goals. Fifth assumption is that states are basically rational actors. They're strategic calculators. States are pretty good at figuring out what is the best way to maximize their prospects of survival in the system. Okay, those are the five assumptions. You take them, you put them in the blender, you hit the on switch, and you mix them up. You get three forms of behavior. The first form of behavior that you get is fear. States in this system fear each other. And they fear each other for two reasons. Two reasons. Number one is you may end up next door living near a state that has a lot of power and malign intentions. It's like to say you may end up living next door to Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. Right? One reason to be fearful. Level of fear varies from case to case, but a lot of fear in the system. Second reason that states fear each other is that if you get into trouble in international politics, there's no higher authority to call because it's an anarchic system. You know, in the United States, if you want to call the police in an emergency, you dial 911. 911. I like to say, if you dial 911 in international politics, you know who's at the other end? Nobody. There's nobody at the other end. Right? And in a system like that, there's a certain level of fear ingrained in every state. That's the first form of behavior, fear. Second form of behavior is self-help. You understand when you operate in an anarchic world that the best way to survive is to take care of yourself. It's a self-help world. As my mother used to say when I was a little boy, God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. Now whether you believe in God or not, the fact of the matter is, in the international system, given that it's anarchic, given that there's nobody at the other end when you dial 911, you better take care of yourself first. The third form of behavior, remember the first is fear, second is self-help. The third form of behavior in this anarchic system where you can never be certain that another state won't have a lot of power and won't put its gun sights on you is to maximize the amount of power that you have. You want to be very powerful. As I often say to American audiences, how many of you go to bed at night worrying about Mexico or Canada or Guatemala or Costa Rica attacking the United States. It's unthinkable. You want to know why? Because we are Godzilla. We are incredibly powerful. Nobody would dare attack us in the Western Hemisphere. It's the best situa situation you can have. You want to be really powerful. In an anarchic system where you can never be certain about the intentions of other states, and some states may end up having a lot of power, right? you want to make sure you have more power than they do. Why? Because you're offensively oriented? No, because it's the best way to survive in an anarchic system. That's the argument. Now the question becomes, what does it mean to be the most powerful state in the system? My argument is that it's impossible to be a global hegemon. The globe is just too big, the planet is just too big, and there's too much water. 
The best that you can do is to be a regional hegemon. You can dominate your region of the world, number one. But number two, you want to make sure that no other great power dominates its region of the world. Okay? Now, you may be asking yourself, why is it important that you not allow another country to dominate its region of the world? I'll give you a quick answer and then I'll explain. Because if another country dominates its region of the world, it's free to roam, free to roam into your backyard. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is he talking about? I often say to American audiences, have you ever thought about why the United States is wandering all over the planet, sticking its nose in everybody's business, deploying military forces here, there, and everywhere? Have you ever thought about that? The reason is we are so secure in the Western Hemisphere. There are virtually no threats to the United States in the Western Hemisphere. There are no other great powers in the Western Hemisphere. That means we are free to roam around the planet because we don't have to worry about our backyard. To go to China, to get way ahead of myself, if China completely dominates Asia, it's free to roam. The United States wants a situation where China has to worry about its neighbors. Because if it has to worry about its neighbors, it has to concentrate on Asia. The United States did not want Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union to dominate Europe. Because then it would be free to roam into the Western Hemisphere, into our backyard. We wanted the Soviets to have to worry about Western Europe, to worry about NATO. We wanted Germany to have to worry about the Soviet Union, before that Russia, to worry about France, to worry about England, because then it's not free to roam. So the story I've told you is starting with those five assumptions, the ideal world for any great power is to be a regional hegemon, to dominate your area of the world, number one, and number two, make sure there is no other regional hegemon on the planet. In the Pentagon, they call this a peer competitor. You don't want a peer competitor, okay? That's the basic theory. Now, let me switch to the second part of my talk, which is to describe American foreign policy from 1783 up to the present. And what I'm gonna do is try and convince you that the United States has behaved according to that theory. As most of you know, when the United States first got its independence, it was comprised of 13 colonies, weak colonies, strung out along the Atlantic seaboard. What happened between 1783 and 1853 is that the United States marched across the continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and murdered huge numbers of Native Americans, stole their land, went to war against Mexico in the 1840s, and stole what is today the southwest of the United States from Mexico. We invaded Canada in 1812. One of the main reasons we invaded Canada in 1812 was to make Canada part of the United States. The reason that Ottawa is the capital of Canada and Toronto is not the capital of Canada is that the Canadians expected, actually the British who were in charge at the time, expected us to pay a return visit sometime in the 19th century and try to conquer Canada. Today what is the Caribbean would be part of the United States were it not for the slavery issue. Southern states were desperate to move into the Caribbean and conquer those islands and make them part of the United States. It was the slavery issue and the fact that northern states did not want any more slaveholding states in the Union that prevented us from going further south. The United States had a voracious appetite for conquest and annexation. 
It's no accident that when Adolf Hitler invaded the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, from that point forward for the next six months, he frequently talked about the United States as a model state for creating Lebensraum. He often referred to the Volga River as his Mississippi. He understood that the United States was very successful at carving out a huge state in North America. What we also did was we were faced with a number of European great powers, in particular the British, the French, and the Spanish, who had empires in the Western Hemisphere. The United States in 1823 issued the Monroe Doctrine. President James Monroe basically told the European great powers, we're not powerful enough to throw you out of the Western Hemisphere now. We eventually will reach that point. We're going to throw you out, and we want you to know you are not welcome back here. This is our hemisphere, and distant great powers are not allowed in the Western Hemisphere. The vast majority of you are not old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1963, but it drove the United States drove the United States mad that the Soviet Union thought about deploying missile forces in the Western Hemisphere, in Cuba. This is just simply unacceptable. And then later, the Soviets were talking about building a naval base at Cienfuegos in Cuba. This is an absolute no-no. Distant great powers don't come into the Western Hemisphere. This is our hemisphere. Everybody better stay out. Right? So you see what we did to create hegemony in the Western Hemisphere is number one, we conquered a huge piece of territory. And we would have conquered more if we could have, right? And then we imported huge numbers of immigrants from Europe, and we created this very powerful state. And number two, we threw the European great powers out. The last act in that process was the Spanish-American War in 1898, where the Spanish Empire was finished in the Western Hemisphere. The British and the French were finished long before that. The United States was a hegemon by 1900. That was not done accidentally. The founding fathers and their successors knew full well what they were doing. They were creating a very powerful state. The last thing they wanted was a European great power in our backyard. This is our backyard. You're out. You stay out. But I told you there are two things that a great power wants to do. One is establish regional hegemony, and we did that. And the second is to make sure that you don't face a peer competitor. Well, the United States faced four peer competitors in the 20th century. And the United States played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union. In 1917, we entered World War I in part because we understood that Germany was on the verge of winning World War I. And the United States would not tolerate a Germany dominating all of Europe. Because as I told you before, a Germany that dominates all of Europe is free to roam. So we entered World War I, and I believe we played the critical role in tipping the balance at the very end of the war against Germany. In World War II, we played the principal role for sure in defeating Imperial Japan in the Pacific half of World War II. And with regard to the European half of that war, the Soviet Union played the key role in defeating Nazi Germany. There is no question about that. The Soviet Union paid the blood price for defeating Germany between 1941 and 1945. But nevertheless, the United States played a very important role, and Britain played a very important role. We were determined to make sure that Nazi Germany did not dominate Europe, just as we were determined to make sure that Imperial Germany did not dominate Europe. And then came the Cold War. The United States played the principal role in containing the Soviet Union, both in Europe and in Asia, during the Cold War. And when the Soviet Union began to collapse, when the Cold War ended, the United States was perfectly willing to usher the Soviet Union to the scrap heap of history, because the United States doesn't like potential peer competitors. So the story I've told you here is that if you look at American foreign policy from 1783 up to the present, basically what you see is a situation where we acted according to my theory. 
we went to great lengths to establish regional hegemony by number one, conquering huge amounts of territory and building a super powerful state, and number two, defeating any potential peer competitors that came about in the 20th century. This brings me to the third part of my talk, China. The question you want to ask yourself is, what is China likely to do if China continues to grow more and more powerful economically? Well, my argument is that what they're going to do is they're going to translate that economic might into military might and they're going to try and create what is by far the most powerful state in Asia, in East Asia to start with. And my argument, as I often tell people, is that the Chinese would be crazy not to do that. If you talk to your average Chinese person, you say, you have two choices. One is you can have a situation where China is 10 times more powerful than Japan, or you can have a situation where Japan is 10 times more powerful than China. Which one do you choose? Do you think it matters? The Chinese will laugh at you. The Chinese understand full well that they better be 10 times more powerful than Japan. And nothing could be worse than having a situation where Japan is 10 times more powerful than China. They remember what happened when China was weak between roughly 1850 and 1950. They refer to it as the century of national humiliation. It's the centerpiece of their nationalism today. Just go home and Google century of national humiliation if you have any doubts about it. The Chinese understand full well what happens when you're weak in international politics. Countries like the United States and countries like Japan, when they're more powerful than you, push you around. The Chinese have every intention of making sure that they build a very powerful state and that none of their neighbors can give them a run for their money militarily. And do I blame them? I don't blame them one bit. If I were the national security advisor in Beijing, I'd be saying, let's build as much military capability as we can. Let's make sure that the gap between us and Russia, us and India, us and Japan, and us and all the other neighbors is as large as possible. Is that because I'm highly aggressive? Is that because I like to beat up on other countries? No. It's because the best way to survive in the international system is to be, as we used to say when I was a young boy in New York City playgrounds, to be the biggest and baddest dude on the block. When you're big and you're powerful, people don't fool around with you. Right? The Chinese fully understand that. Second thing that the Chinese understand is that it would be very nice if they could push the Americans out of East Asia. Do you think the Chinese are happy about the idea that the United States deploys all these military forces right on their doorstep, runs ships, and aircraft right up their coast, up and down their coastline. You think the Chinese are happy about that? They're not. They're not happy about that any more than we'd be happy if the Chinese came into the Caribbean and stationed forces in Cuba and ran aircraft and naval ships along the coast of Florida. I told you about the Cuban Missile Crisis. We did not like the idea of the Soviet Union coming into the Western Hemisphere right off our right off our border in Cuba. We did not like that. You think the Chinese should be happy about having the Americans in their backyard? Well, they're not. As my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we can have a Monroe Doctrine, why don't you think they're going to want to have a Monroe Doctrine? Well, they are. They might not put it in those terms. And by the way, the Chinese will tell you behind closed doors and occasionally in public that they plan to push us out beyond the first island chain, if they can, and then out beyond the second island chain. And my view is, if I were national security advisor in Beijing, I'd be very interested in pushing the Americans out beyond the second island chain. I'd be very interested in pushing them back to Hawaii and keeping them out of East Asia. Why would I, as a Chinese policymaker, want the Americans on my doorstep? Any more than why should I, as an American policymaker, want the Soviets or the Germans or the Chinese in the Caribbean? Very simple. Again, the structure of the system pushes states in this direction. 
So what I'm saying to you is, if you're surprised over how the Chinese are behaving in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea, and with regard to the Americans, with regard to the Japanese, you should not be. And it's going to get much worse. Because the power balance, remember, we're assuming that China is going to continue to grow. China is going to grow more and more powerful. And the more powerful it grows, the more it's going to push states around in Asia. Because it's going to try and dominate Asia the way that the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. This brings me to the last part of the talk. How are China's neighbors, to include Russia, and the United States likely to react? We start with the United States. First of all, I told you what the theory says, and the empirical record is very clear here. We have four cases from the 20th century, Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. And I laid the theory out for you. We're not going to tolerate it. We're going to go to enormous lengths to prevent China from dominating Asia. This is what the pivot to Asia is all about. You remember when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State in 2011, and she announced the pivot to Asia. The Obama administration dressed it up as uh, some sort of benign move that had nothing to do with containment. Right? The Chinese are not fools, and they understood full well what was going on. We're, we're, we're in the business of containing China. We're scared of China. You can't say that too loudly in Washington, because people don't think it's politically correct at this point in time. But in Beijing, they understand full well what's going on. The United States is not going to tolerate a hegemon in Asia. It may ultimately have no choice. China has so many people that if its wealth approximates anything like the wealth of South Korea, Taiwan, or Hong Kong, it may be, may be so powerful that we can't prevent it from dominating Asia. But in the meantime, we'll go to great lengths to prevent them from dominating, prevent the Chinese from dominating Asia. And the historical record is clear on this. This brings us to the neighbors. You can already see the balancing coalition beginning to form. India, Japan, Vietnam, South Korea, Singapore. You're going to have a balancing coalition. And I believe, and I'll talk about, a bit more about this in a second, it will ultimately include the Russians. And it'll be a balancing coalition designed to help contain China, much the way we put together a balancing coalition in the Cold War to contain the Soviet Union. And the fact of the matter is that China's neighbors are more scared of China than they are of the United States, because the United States is 6,000 miles away across the Pacific Ocean. The United States is not a threat to conquer any territory in East Asia. China is a threat to its neighbors because it lives right next door. So you'll get a balancing coalition. For anybody who has any doubts about this or wants to read and think more about it, just go home and Google India-Japan strategic relations. India-Japan strategic relations. You'll be amazed at the number of sites that come up, because this is a hot topic these days. The Indians and the Japanese are scared of a rising China, as they should be. And they are thinking about different ways to contain the Chinese. Let me just say a few words about the Russians. Uh, I don't want to get into the subject of the Ukraine crisis, but I, I believe that American policy towards Russia today is remarkably foolish uh, for a variety of reasons. But one of the principal reasons is that we have, in effect, driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. The United States is facing a potential peer competitor in East Asia. For a great power like the United States, there is no possible threat that is more worrisome than a potential peer competitor. There is nothing out there that should scare us as much as the rise of China. And for purposes of containing China, we're going to need all the help we can get. And that means we're going to need help from the Russians. The idea that we're pursuing a policy that is driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese is idiotic. It's just hard to believe that we're doing it. I believe, however, that with the passage of time, the United States will come to its senses, and relations between China and Russia will deteriorate to the point where the Russians and the Chinese will become allies. And I think the Russians will ultimately become part of that balancing coalition uh, against China. I certainly hope that's the case. Uh, that's what a structural realist theory would say. 
But as you know, uh, structural realist theories, like all theories, are never perfect, and there are always cases that contradict the theory. This brings me to my final point, and then we can go to Q&A. Uh, as you know, I said this is a theoretical exercise, and my analysis is based on my realist theory of international politics. But no theory is perfect. Uh, theories are simplifications of reality. We live in an enormously complicated world. And the reason that we need theories is to make sense of that world. But theories, because they're simplifications of reality, end up leaving certain factors on the cutting room floor. In other words, domestic politics, whether a state is a democracy or not, what its particular culture looks like matters little in my story. Because again, it's a structural realist story. Domestic politics is left on the cutting room floor. But occasionally, domestic politics matters a great deal. And those are the cases where my theory doesn't work. I like to say that I believe that the best theories in international politics get it right 75% of the time. And they're wrong 25% of the time. Again, I want to be clear here. You need theories to understand the world. Whether you're talking about raising children, running domestic politics, or running international politics. We all need theories to make sense of this complicated world. But what you want to understand is that because theories are simplifications of a complicated reality, they're not always right. So what I'm telling you is that 25% of the time, I believe my theory is wrong. And I believe my theory is pretty good, as theories go, as you would expect. But wrong 25% of the time. Let's just hope that with regard to my predictions regarding the rise of China, that I'm wrong this time, and China can rise peacefully. Thank you. I will gladly take questions, and I see they have microphones on the outskirts of the group, but I don't think most people are going to be able to get to those microphones uh, without either killing themselves or somebody else in the process. So, oh, they're going to pass the microphones around. So, if you just raise your hand, I'll try and call on as many people as I can. And if people would just identify themselves, stand up and identify yourself, and make sure you talk into the microphone so everybody can hear you. Uh, thank you for such thought-provoking speech. Uh, my question is rather theoretical. Uh, why are uh, intentions of leaders are so important, since it's uh, the structure of the international system that shapes the, the behavior of states? Okay. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a structural theory, a structural theory can focus on individuals, as this young woman indicated, and it can focus on particular states, okay, as long as the assumption about that individual, or those individuals, or the assumption about states applies to all states or all individuals, okay? In other words, if I said you could not be certain about the intentions of authoritarian leaders, but you could be certain about the intentions of democratic leaders, that would not be structural because you're discriminating inside the black box or among individuals. But if you simply say, I am assuming that you cannot be certain about the intentions of any other individual or any other leader, then it's completely consistent with the structural theory. Let me give you another example. Some people have asked your question in a slightly different way. They've said, John, you say this is a structural theory, but you're talking about survival as the principal goal of all states. You're looking at leaders and you're saying their goal is survival. How can that be structural? You're focusing on the leaders of states. 
And my answer is it can be structural as long as you assume that every unit in the structure is making the same assumption. Okay? So that's how you do it. Thank you for your lecture. I just have a question about um, the last proposition that you were uh, sort of voiced, uh, whether uh, US is pushing Russia into China's arms, so to speak. And what do you think of the notion that the US is um, alienating Russia just for sole purpose of that in the years to come, it would be easy game for China and Japan to split. So, so if I understand your argument, your argument is that the United States is trying to weaken Russia so that China and Japan can take advantage of Russia? Yes. I don't think there's any evidence that, that, that the Chinese or the Japanese are interested in taking advantage of Russia in any meaningful way. The Chinese and the Japanese are busy hating each other at the moment. <laughs> and uh, and the, principal, uh, the principal issue between them at, at this point in time are these small islands, actually collections of rocks in the East China Sea uh, that both countries consider to be sacred territory, and both countries seem to be willing to fight over. Uh, so I don't see any evidence that Japan and China want to weaken Russia. If this was 1938 or 1939, it, it would be a difference. I meant the other way around, that the US wants to weaken Russia because it knows that from a historical record, China will never be a true ally of Russia. The relations have been severed or, so, so to speak, worsened. They're not going to return to the same kind of uh, framework that it used to have with the Soviet Union. Because, uh, you know, China and Soviet Union, up to the 1970s, they were, uh, you say, in the form of alignment. Whereas when they had falling out after that, there's no way for uh, China ever regarding or looking at Russia as a true ally or partner. Yeah. I, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think the United States really knows what it's doing uh, with regard to Russia, just more generally. I don't think, it, I don't think it's that Machiavellian. Hello, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. Um, concern, concerning China's relations with the West or the US, what, how much credibility do you give to the China's peaceful rights theory? Uh, which was official policy policy during Hu Jintao, and um, whether they they perceived that they would seek he hegemonic stability through harmonious international relations and so on, because the U.S. and China are mutual dependent with each other. Thanks. Well, there's no question that the Chinese are deeply interested in making the argument that they can rise peacefully. And furthermore, there's no question that the Chinese would like to rise peacefully. Uh, no country in its right mind would want to have a major war with any of its neighbors or with the United States, or even have terrible relations with the Americans over time. So the Chinese go to great lengths to make the argument uh, that we need to work on establishing some sort of new theory or new understanding of international politics uh, so that China's rise can be accommodated. And I understand that completely. But my argument is that's not possible in an anarchic system where you can never know the intentions of other states and other states may have significant offensive military capability. As you know, my book is entitled The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And I think this is a tragic situation. I've been to China a number of times. Uh, I, I like the Chinese very much. And intellectually, intellectually, I'm much more at home in China than I am in the United States. Because China is a realist country, and the United States is not. Uh, I, I sometimes say when I go to China and I give talks, that it's good to be back among my people, right? No, I don't speak one word of Chinese. 
and Chinese culture is, it's, it's in another world to an American like me. But even though I'm culturally a fish out of water in China, intellectually I'm right at home in China. So I like the Chinese and I understand what they're doing. But I think in an anarchic system, they're gonna end up head to head with the United States. I think it's just inevitable. So I think all their talk uh, about peaceful rise is just talk. Let me just make one other point about this. If you're playing China's hand, you're China, it's in your interest not to have trouble now and to keep as quiet as possible and talk about peace and love and dope and just grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And then when you're really powerful, you lay down the terms of engagement in East Asia. You understand that from an American point of view, for purposes of establishing the rules of engagement with a rising China, for purposes of dealing, drawing the red lines that define acceptable and unacceptable behavior, from an American point of view, now is the best time to do it because the balance of power shifts against us over time. The balance of power shifts in China's favor over time. So China's smart strategy, in my opinion, is to be quiet now. Don't say much, don't cause trouble, and just wait till you become so powerful that you can dictate the terms of any settlement. And again, China's neighbors and the United States understand that logic, right? And that's why they're much more interested in trying to establish the rules of the road now. So to go back to your question, I think from China's point of view, you want to talk about now, you want to talk about the fact we can rise peacefully, we have a Confucian culture, we don't like to fight wars, we are very defensively oriented, and so forth and so on, so that you can delay settling any of these disputes, you can delay establishing the rules of the road. Uh, thank you very, very much for your bright speech. And uh, if I'm permitted to ask you two questions. First of all, uh, is there any other state except for the USA and China that has a potential to become a regional hegemon? And uh, the second question is, do you think Russia can build its own safe backyard somewhere in the region and become a regional hegemon? And how, how is it possible since China is on our eastern border? Thank you. Uh, I can answer both of those questions together because in answering the first question, I sort of talk about the Russian case. I think there's only one country on the planet that stands a chance of becoming a regional hegemon, and that's China. Uh, it, it, in fact, I think if China does not continue to grow, let's say the Chinese economy flatlines or the Chinese economy begins to uh, decline over time, uh, I think the United States will be more powerful relative to everybody else in the year 2050 than it is now. If you think the United States is causing a lot of trouble now, wait you know, until 2050 uh, if China doesn't continue to grow. Uh, let's just talk about Germany. You know Germany is depopulating. Germany now has the largest population in Europe, leaving aside the Russians. Germany has the largest population in Europe by far, probably about 18 million more people than the French and the British. By the year 2050, Germany will be roughly tied with France for the second largest population in Europe. Britain will have the largest population in Europe. Uh, so the idea that you know Germany is gonna be a threat to dominate Europe is not in the cards. Russia's not a threat to dominate Europe. Uh, the Russian economy is nowhere near uh, what the American economy or the German economy or even the Chinese economy is at. Uh, Population-wise, the Russians, it's hard to say for sure where they're headed, uh, but they were depopulating for quite a while. It looks like it's leveled off now. What the long term looks like is hard to say, but it's hard to see significant population growth. I think, Germ I think Russia will continue to be a great power, but nothing more than a great power. It's not gonna be the second coming uh, of the Soviet Union. 
Uh, Japan is depopulating. I think Japan has the most rapidly depopulating, it's the most rapidly depopulating country uh, in the world. Uh, India is sometimes held up as a country that could be uh, a challenge to the United States because its population is increasing substantially. But India has a real problem with human capital and it can't translate that large population into the sort of economic performance that you get with a country like China. So I don't see, uh, I don't see India as a serious uh, threat to the United States. I think the only serious threat to the United States at this point in time, the only potential peer competitor out there is China. Yes, this book. Thank you so much for your speech, and I have two questions. The first one, uh, given the fact that China is rising and uh, the USA pursuing its policy toward uh, China, will it rely on uh, soft power or hard power? And the second one is uh, this project TPP. Can we say that uh, it is a so-called economic NATO that is aimed at uh, countering China? That's all. Her first question had to do with whether or not the United States would rely on soft power or hard power. Uh, the simple answer is that it will rely on both. Uh, the, the more sophisticated answer is that with regard to China, we will rely mainly on hard power. Uh, that this will be a competition that's based mainly uh, on economic and military power. And uh, uh, it's just the nature of this relationship, given that we are operating in a realist world, that means that hard power is what matters the most. My sense is that what the Chinese respect the most and what the Americans respect the most is raw power. Uh, so I think in the final analysis, the foundation will be uh, military and economic power, and then soft power will be the superstructure. Uh, with regard to the TPP, uh, I think there's no question that the United States intended the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, to be something of an economic alliance directed at uh, China. Most people thought that was a foolish idea uh, to begin with, uh, but it appears at this point in time uh, that the TPP is not going to become uh, uh, a reality because of opposition inside the United States. Uh, as you know from watching Donald Trump and even Hillary Clinton now, uh, there's a great deal of animosity in the United States towards things like free trade. And it's hard for me to imagine the TPP getting passed. Uh, but even if it does get passed in the United States, I, I don't think it's going to have much effect. I think if the United States is going to seriously contain China, it's going to have to build a military alliance structure in Asia that looks a lot like the alliance structure that it had in Europe during the Cold War. Sir? Uh, thank you for your lecture, and I've got one question. As we know from the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the growth of importance of China in Latin America in economic terms has been, well, really impressive. And it feels like the U.S. hasn't been really able to come up with an adequate answer to it. And so uh, how can the U.S. stop China from deepening and strengthening the economic relations with Latin American countries uh, except for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even if it comes to life. Thank you. I think there's no question that if you look at Chinese economic interests in places like Africa and places like Latin America, uh, they have grown substantially over time. The fact is the United States doesn't care one way or the other whether China has economic relations with Latin American countries. It's not a threat to the United States. What's a threat to the United States is China forming a military alliance with Brazil or Canada or Mexico or Cuba and moving military forces into the Western Hemisphere. The economic dimension uh, doesn't matter at all, so we pay hardly any attention to it. I'll take the gentleman on your left. Yeah. 
Yeah, good evening. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, actually, I'd like to ask you about your, one of your assumptions. You've mentioned that Russia eventually will join uh, the balancing coalition against China. Um, but because uh, Russia afraid China's dominance more than uh, United States dominance in, in the world. But I'd like to remind you about the situation that was in 1930s in Europe, when um, Germany and Italy, they've had their differences about Austria, about uh, Slo Slovenia, and other differences, but they've overcame them. And um, I have a question, why can't uh, just happen with Russia and China? Why can't uh, just in the future, Russia join the alliance against um, Western world that was leading, but that was led, is going to be led by United States. Thank you. Well, the fact is, if the United States was to continue to act in Eastern Europe the way it's acted over uh, the past 15 years with NATO expansion, EU expansion, and the efforts to bring countries like Ukraine uh, into the West's orbit, uh, I think that uh, it's unlikely that Russia would be part of a balancing coalition uh, against uh, against China. I mean, but here, here's what I think is going to happen over time. And this involves, this is actually an important subject, getting into the business of American grand strategy. Uh, the United States has th three areas of the world that it cares about greatly and has historically cared about greatly. These are the three areas of the world where we have been willing to fight and die in large numbers. One is East Asia two is Europe, and three is the Persian Gulf. And historically for the United States, the most important area of the world strategically has been Europe. From 1783 up until roughly the present, Europe has been the most important area of the world for the United States. Not Asia, not the Persian Gulf. They're of secondary importance, but those are the three areas of the world. A fundamental change is taking place in American grand strategy that most people don't fully grasp, even in the United States, and that is that East Asia is replacing Europe as the most important area of the world for the United States. Remember, I talked about the pivot to Asia. Hillary Clinton said the United States is pivoting to Asia. Well, when you pivot to somewhere, that means you're pivoting away from some other place. The place that we are ultimately going to pivot away from is Europe, because there's no real reason for us to be in Europe. The idea that we're causing all this trouble in Eastern Europe over Ukraine is ridiculous. It's foolish in the extreme. The United States has no strategic interest in Ukraine or Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia. It just doesn't matter to the United States. Russia is not, to answer your question, a potential hegemon. Germany's not a potential hegemon. There's no great power in Europe that is so powerful that we have to be there to check it. There is in East Asia, it's called China. That's what the pivot to Asia is all about. So what's gonna happen here is that the United States, as China continues to rise, is slowly but steadily going to leave Europe and head to Asia. You know, I told you that Europe has historically been the number one priority for the United States, followed by East Asia, followed by the Gulf. The future, Rank ordering is going to be East Asia one, the Gulf second, and the reason the Gulf is number two is all that oil that China gets from the Gulf, right? The Chinese are going to be very interested in the Gulf. They're talking about building a blue water navy. They already get 25% of their oil. 25% of their oil comes from the Gulf. And Europe is going to be number three for the United States. And it's going to be a distant three because there's no real reason for us to be in Europe. The idea that we're expanding NATO is, in my opinion, remarkably foolish, especially since it alienates the Russians who we need to balance against the Chinese. So the argument that I would make is that slowly but steadily, our interest in Eastern Europe will recede. Our interest in Europe will recede. Our interest in East Asia will go up as China continues to grow. And therefore, American pressure on the Russians in Eastern Europe will decline. And once that begins to happen, and the Russians begin to worry about an increasingly powerful China, which is their next door neighbor, it will be reasonably easy to fix the situation. 
Now, some of you might say, this is impossible because relations have been so thoroughly poisoned between Russia and the United States that it's hard to imagine the two countries ever coming together. To counter that, I would point out that the United States and China were bitter enemies during the first half of the Cold War. I don't know how many of you know this, but during the Korean War, which lasted from 1950 to 1953, the United States did not fight North Korean units for the most part. It fought the Chinese. The Korean War was basically an American-Chinese war. We were bitter enemies throughout the 50s and throughout the 60s. And then all of a sudden in the early 1970s, things changed. And from the early 1970s until the end of the Cold War, the United States and the Chinese were basically allied against the Soviet Union. And I think a similar situation will happen with regard to US-Russian relations. But as I said before, I may be wrong. Uh, the gentleman in the rear, you can yeah, just step up. Thank you very much, Mr. Mishemer, for your lecture. Uh, my question will be more theoretical. So you said that uh, survival is one of the main goals uh, of the state. So uh, how different types of state interactions uh, can create different types of uh, cultures of anarchy, uh, in your opinion? What exactly does that mean, cultures of anarchy? That, that's not my language. That's what Wen said. You have, you, have to you have to translate that for me. That's what Wen said. Right. Well, Alex Wen used to teach at the University of Chicago uh, with me, and I played a key role in hiring him there. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think that he is, a, I want to be very careful here, I think he's a brilliant IR theorist. Okay, you understand that. I think Alex Wendt is a brilliant IR theorist, but he's fundamentally wrong about how international <laughs> politics works. For me, material factors matter the most, with some qualifications. Getting back to my point in response to this young woman's question about intentions. Uh, but the fact is that the material structure of the international system is anarchic and it forces states to behave in particular ways. You said in the beginning of your comments that survival is one of the main goals of states. I would say to you, that's not what I said. I said survival is the main goal, right? It is the main goal. And in an anarchic world, again, it's a material description that matters here. In an anarchic world where survival is the principal goal, you have no choice but to compete with other great powers to make sure you are more powerful than they are. And I think all this talk about cultures of anarchy in the end just doesn't make much sense. But you so, want to come back at me. So Henry Kissinger is wrong. Well, Henry Kissinger has been wrong on many issues. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Thank you. I just want to say two things on that. My first point is every realist opposed the Vietnam War except Henry Kissinger. Every realist I know opposed the Iraq War. You know I was one of the leading opponents of the Iraq War in the United States. My buddy Steve Walt and I led the charge against the Iraq War in 2003. Every realist was against the Iraq War against, except Henry Kissinger. Professor, thank you for visiting our university and giving us your lecture. So let me ask you two theoretical questions. The first one will be based on Thomas Kuhn's logic about paradigms and crisis in them. So how can we understand that realist paradigm is still a developing one and it is able to elucidate properly the current events and states of affairs and national relations, but not a uh, stagnating one that is working only on justifying and defending itself from the criticism of, for example, constructivists 
uh, postmodernist who proposed new variables and uh, proposed using uh, multi-causal synthesis for explaining international relations, or neoclassical liberals who have an amalgam of approaches that are quite flexible in illuminating processes in our world. And the second one. No, no, you, you could only ask one at a time. I could never remember everything. <laughs> I, I, I have limited storage capacity. In my, you can ask the second question, but first I got to answer ah, okay. th that question. Uh, just a couple points. One is, first of all, a lot of these multi-causal stories and classical realism fits in that category, they're not theories because they're not simplifications of reality, right? Uh, what do the classical realists tell you? That it's not only structure that matters, John, domestic variables matter. This domestic variable matters, that domestic variable matters, that domestic variable matters. Thanks a lot. I, you know, in the end, everything matters. My big toe matters, right? The question is how much? And as I said to you before, a good theory is a simplification of reality. And once you start throwing in every other variable that you can think up, right, it just stops becoming a theory and it becomes a description. And this is my problem with classical realism. I don't think it's a theory. It just says domestic politics matters and international politics matters. Just to give you an example, the argument that's used against me whenever I give this talk, time after time, is economic interdependence theory. And this gentleman over here hinted at that. I just didn't have enough time to address it. When I go to China, the argument that's used against me, it's not defensive realism, right? It's not nuclear weapons, which is the argument I'd use against me, right? It's not democratic peace theory. It's economic interdependence theory. Simple argument. Chinese, China's neighbors, the United States are all hooked on capitalism. They're all economically interdependent. Everybody's getting rich. And who in their right mind would kill the goose that lays the golden eggs by starting a war? So economic considerations will trump security considerations in the end. I think this is wrong, but it's an elegant theory. It's a simple theory, unlike classical realism and these multivariable theories that people are throwing around. Just a quick point about Thomas Kuhn. Look, theories are never finished. Uh, 50 years from now, you won't be sitting here, but successor generations will be sitting here. I won't be here, I'll be long put in the ground, right? But somebody will be up here lecturing on what is a hot IR theory, and it won't be my theory, it'll be a different theory. Theories evolve over time. Theories are never once and for all. So what we have here is a world in where people are constantly trying to refine existing theories and come up with new theories. And because theories are never completely right, as I told you, I think my theory gets it right 75% of the time. It means it's wrong 25% of the time. Others are going to try and come up with a theory that gets it right almost all the time. And this is a really good thing. And it's just the nature of the enterprise. So in the second question. Don't you consider that uh, you as a respected expert and distinguished expert in international relations and wide academic uh, communities can more or less have an influence on uh, knowledge production and by doing so control and uh, uh, determine policy making, policy maker learning that therefore change states interest and hence make them be dynamic and be of non-systemic structural origin? Thank you. Yeah. This is a great question. It sort of gets at the went question. And the, the basic argument here is that ideas really matter. And I have ideas, and other scholars have ideas. And can't we come up with ideas that change how policymakers think? Right? This is a very Wentian view of international politics. Because as you know, Alex and other social constructivists believe that discourse matters. And they believe that scholars who help shape that discourse can change the discourse in ways that facilitate more peaceful relations among states. I, of course, think that scholars matter, but not very much. You understand that? I think the structure of the system forces states to behave in particular ways. I tried to make this point clear in the beginning of my talk. 
you know, I once had a conversation with Alex Went when he was my colleague on this very issue. And I told him that he was, I said, Alex, I think you're really bothered by the fact that uh, I go before large audiences like this and I make these presentations and I pollute the brains of young people. I make you think uh, in realist terms, which leads to uh, a more competitive world than otherwise would be the case. And I, I think that for, you know, for people like Alex, it would be much better if it was people like himself and people who had a more uh, peaceful and cooperative story to tell who could get up in front of audiences and you could limit people from me, people like me, from influencing the likes of you. And I said, but the truth is, I don't think it matters whether I speak to students or not, because those students, once they become policy makers, will behave like good realists anyway. Because you'll quickly figure out what the structure dictates, and you'll act accordingly. Uh, so I am ultimately a structural realist of the first order. Yes. Well, I'll take this woman, then this woman. That's fine. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for an insightful lecture. I got two questions as well. Um, concerning the first one, let me refer to two uh, U.S. Uh, TV programs, which are Hot Talk and Intellectual Debate, uh, where U.S. foreign, foreign policy makers uh, say, maintain quite often, that uh, Russia doesn't have any allies. Uh, how is that possible for a state to have any allies at all if, according to the neorealist paradigm, um, well, a state has its own intentions, which are not known to the others, and its principal or main goal is survival. And another question I have concerns... Could, could, could you just, one at a time, what, what was the question now? What exactly was the question? How can a state, what? How can a state possibly have any allies uh, if its principal goal is survival, according to the neorealist paradigm? Well, let's go back to the 19, early 1940s. There's okay. this country called Nazi Germany, right? And it's fighting a war against France and Britain. It defeats France, and then it's at war with Britain, and then it invades the Soviet Union. Don't you think it makes perfect sense that the Soviet Union and Britain would become allies because they face a common threat? It does, actually. <laughs> yes. Answers my question. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 just take India and Japan, the point that I made to you before. Take Vietnam and the United States. When I was your age, the United States was fighting this brutal and bitter war in Vietnam. I believe that the United States probably killed about two million Vietnamese. It was a horrible war. And nevertheless, the Vietnamese and the United States are reasonably good friends today. Mm -hmm. Since the mid-1990s, Vietnam and the United States have been moving closer and closer together. And the question is, why is this the case? And it's the rise of China, right? The, Viet the Vietnamese are scared stiff of a rising China. And they understand that the United States is also deeply fearful of a rising China. So that's driving the Vietnamese and the Americans together. Uh, so it's very easy to explain why you get alliances Okay. Uh, much less friendly relations. Okay, another question, uh, thank you. Another question I got uh, concerns uh, the policy of the United States towards China, uh, managing the rise of China. What the United States are going to use uh, more, containment strategy, engagement strategy, or both? There was a question about smart power and hard power and the balance between them, but uh, the question I have is relates to some other terms like containment engagement. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, on containment versus engagement, uh, engagement is basically an umbrella term for pursuing the liberal foreign policies mm -hmm. that would lead to more peaceful relations, in theory, with China. Uh, engagement involves more trade, promoting democracy, making China part of institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth and so on. Uh, that, that's what engagement is all about. And it's, it's the opposite of containment. Containment is what I'm talking about today. Uh, I think that in the 1990s, the Clinton administration went to enormous lengths to emphasize engagement over containment. 
what's happened since the start of the new century, since 2000, is that the United States has moved more towards containment and away from engagement. We still have a policy today which contains elements of both engagement and containment. And my argument is that over time, the policy will be more containment oriented than engagement oriented. If I can make one more point on this, which is important to understand. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union, or the West and the Soviet Union, had remarkably little economic intercourse. There was you know, very little economic interaction. Uh, uh, and it was basically a security competition. Before World War I, in contrast, and before World War II, you had a great deal of economic intercourse here in Europe, in addition to having an intense security competition. As many of you know, before World War I, before 1914, there was a great deal of economic interdependence in Europe. At the same time, there was this wicked security competition between the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance that led to World War I. So the period before World War I and the period before World War II was very different than the Cold War. Right? Guys like me did not come to the Soviet Union during the Cold War except at the very end. The Soviet Union was another universe. Right? It's just there was a real wall between the West and the Soviet Union and its allies. China and the US-China relationship and China's relationship with its neighbors looks much more like Europe before World War I and World War II. That means that you're going to have a great deal of economic intercourse over the long term between China and its neighbors. At the same time, you're going to have a security competition. This is why, as I said to you a few minutes ago, so many people believe that the best argument against me is the economic interdependence argument. You see, the economic interdependence argument grows out of the fact that there are going to be, there is now, and there are going to be profound economic relations between China and the United States and China and its neighbors. And the question is, can those economic relations keep those competitive instincts that come out of the security arrangement at bay. Yeah, why don't you just pass it to the woman to your right? Um, Professor Mayor Sharmer, thank you so much for your thought-provoking lecture. Um, I think I heard during your lecture, please correct me if I'm wrong, there was an effort to equate world peace with the US hegemony, which I don't necessarily think has to be the case. And I think a lot of the buzz that I hear at Mugimo these days is about multipolarity. So my question is, do you think structurally it is possible to have a shift in world order from, US hegemon uh, from American hegemony to multipolarity? And what are the conditions for that to happen? Thank you. OK, well, I, I want to be very clear here. Okay. Uh, I was not equating U.S. hegemony with world peace. Uh, first of all, I don't think the United, I want to be clear here, I don't think the United States is a global hegemon. I think the United States is a regional hegemon. It's also very important to emphasize that the United States, although it's been by far the most powerful state on the planet since the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, and some people refer to this as the unipolar moment. Uh, despite that fact, the United States has been involved in seven wars. And the United States has been at war for two out of every three years since the Cold War ended. You, you realize that? The United States has been at war for two out of every three years since the Cold War ended. And we have fought seven different wars. So the idea that the United States is a peace-loving country is not an argument that I would make. I've been opposed to almost all these wars. I want to be clear on that. But the fact is, we have fought those wars. right? Now, your question is, 
are we now moving into a multipolar world? Uh, I actually believe that we have been in a multipolar world since the Cold War ended. I I'm one of those few people who argued that this was not the unipolar moment and that Russia and China were both great powers. But surely the United States was much more powerful than both Russia and China. But let's say I was wrong, that my definition of polarity was incorrect, and we were in a unipolar world. I think what's happening now is that because of China's continuing rise, and because of the fact that Russia has effectively come back from the dead since 2000, uh, that Russia and China are presenting threats to the United States, or to put it in different terms, are challenging the United States in ways that was not the case in the 1990s. Just think about the United States' situation in the world in 1992. The Soviet Union had just collapsed. What was left was a giant mess. Russia was in no position to project military power. Nobody knew what was going to happen to the Russian economy and the Russian military for a long time. And China was just beginning its rise. Today, in the year 2016, or 2016, in the year 2016, you have a China that is much more powerful than it was in 1992. And you have a Russia that is basically reconstituted and is more, much more effective on the world stage than it was in 1992. Russia today is completely, a completely different story than Russia in 1992. And the Russians have given the United States fits in recent years. Uh, it's one of the principal reasons that the Americans are so mad at Putin and Russia, because Russia has been so successful at executing its foreign policy and thwarting American ambitions. That was not the case in 1992. And at the same time, we're now talking about a potential peer competitor in East Asia in the form of China. So there's no question that it's a very different world. The other thing that's happened that's very important to understand is that military force has real limits. In 1989, when the Cold War ended, and then in the early 1990s, many Americans believed that we had this magic instrument called the US military that we could use here, there, and everywhere to get our way. We were really powerful, and we could employ this military instrument to achieve great victories around the world. But for anybody who studies military affairs closely, or for anybody who's been in the American military or any other military for any appreciable period of time, you quickly come to understand the limits of military force. The US military, just to expand on this a bit, the US military is very good at toppling governments. You want to invade a country like Iraq and knock off Saddam Hussein, we can do it like that. You want to invade Iran and knock off the government, you can do it like that. You want to invade Afghanistan and knock off the government, you can do it like that. Same thing in Syria. The United States has got a really powerful military. And when you turn it loose in a straightforward conventional war where the goal is to beat up on the other side's military forces and topple the regime, few countries are better at it than us. But the problem is you then own those countries. <laughs> and, and you have to do social engineering. You have to do nation building. You have to do state building. And the US military, I want to be very clear here, is no good at that. <laughs> Do you understand? It is no good at that. So there are real limits to what you can do with that military. And just to talk about expanding NATO eastward, right? Do you really want to fight a war with the Russians over the Baltic states? You start thinking about the power projection problems, 
the diplomatic complications, the military complications, the economic complications. I mean, there are just real limits to what the United States can do with all this military force, right? So it's just very important to sort of keep that in mind. And what's happened here is not only has the balance of power changed, that was my first part of my answer to your question, not only has the balance of power changed over time, where the United States is less powerful relative to China and Russia today right, than it was in 1992, but we now have in the United States and around the world a much healthier sense of the limits of American power. right, and. The fact that people now understand that the Americans are not as adept at using that military power that they have at their disposal makes it even harder for us to get our way. Sir. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I, I'm from China, and uh, as a... <laughs> <laughs> I, I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me why I'm wrong. Okay. Are you going to tell me why I'm wrong? Uh, as a Chinese student, uh, <laughs> and to be honest, uh, I'm very happy to hear that you your assumption that China will rise. <laughs> but, but <laughs> it's it's only an assumption. <laughs> yeah, but uh, to be honest, uh, if our rise will break the peace. It is not what, what I want to see. Uh, to be, this is truly. And my question is, um, how do you think? Uh, you mentioned that um, it is a very foolish situation that America push uh, Russia uh, in the army of uh, China. And uh, uh, how do you think it is a stumble or fault of US foreign policy or in purpose? So if it is in purpose, what is the logic behind this? What is the logic of <laughs> Uncle Sam behavior? Thank you. Boy, that's a hard question. Let me just say, I want to just tell a story in response to your first set of comments. He, he said that as, uh, as a Chinese student, he is uh, not interested in seeing conflict. Uh, and he would like to see China rise peacefully which makes perfect sense, and I agree with you. And again, my argument is it's a tragic situation. But I just want to tell you a story about when I go to China, uh, and even when I talk to Chinese uh, people in the United States, or in, when I'm in Europe, uh, I ask them this question. I say, look, in the early 1980s, China decided that it was going to have good relations with the West, and it was going to get hooked on capitalism. It was going to integrate itself into the Western economic order. And it was going to get rich. And that's exactly what happened. Starting in the early 1980s, the Chinese started to integrate into the Western economic system. And they have benefited greatly. The Chinese economy has grown by leaps and bounds. And we're in the situation we're talking about China as a potential peer competitor. So China's done very well for itself. So I say to the Chinese who I talk to, look, why don't you, given this history, just accept the fact that the United States runs the world and that we are the protectors of the international economic order, and you just sit back and continue to get rich. Don't challenge the United States. Don't challenge America's position in East Asia. Don't try to imitate the United States in East Asia. Don't try to become a potential hegemon in East Asia the way we are in the Western Hemisphere. Just let the United States continue to run the international system. And all you do is continue to get rich and prosperous and live happily ever after. And I say to the Chinese, look, the United States is not threatening to invade your country. We're not a serious security threat to you. Just relax. I have never met a single Chinese who accepts that proposition. Okay. China says, we are a growing power. 
we want to have all these capabilities, and we don't like the idea that the Americans by themselves run the system. We want a situation where we have more voice at the table, where we have military capabilities that rival America's military capabilities. We do not like the fact that you have all these military forces in East Asia, right? All that's to say, the Chinese understand, I think, instinctively that the idea that the Americans run the system is unacceptable to them. Right? They understand that that's just not an acceptable situation, and they want to change it. And I understand why the Chinese want to change it. I laid the logic out for you. But my point is, if you don't accept American domination, and you want to challenge American domination, that's what we're talking about here. The Chinese are talking about challenging American domination. Right? They're talking about challenging our position in East Asia. The United States will not take that lying down. It just won't. And the Chinese, of course, have all sorts of good reasons for wanting to push the Americans out. But the end result is the tragedy of great power politics. Right. Now, what was your second question again? The, the it's just about uh, the logic. So uh, it is obvious that uh, the Uncle Sam doesn't want to see that Russia and China stand against him. Both oh, yes, you were asking me. Yeah. But oh, yes, right, right. right. Is they right. Did. Yeah, right. His, 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 right. his question to me was what is the logic behind America's foreign policy? Uh, why, why is it? Or yeah. This is a question I have no answer for. <laughs> it's very rare for me to say that, but I just scratch my head and wonder what the Americans are thinking. I just, I find it, uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I find it mind boggling that we have created a situation where we're driving the Russians and the Chinese closer together. It's just not in their interest. It's analogous to this situation. It's the late 1930s, early 1940s. There are two threats in Europe to the United States. One is the Soviet Union, and the other is Nazi Germany. If you're the United States, you have to choose between the Soviet Union, Stalin's Soviet Union, and Hitler's Nazi Germany. You can't, if you're the United States, you can't fight against both of them. You've got to side with one against the other. You have to make a decision as to who is the greater threat. And we made that decision. We decided that correctly that Nazi Germany was by far the greater threat, which it was. And the United States allied itself with the Soviet Union in World War II. The United States and the Soviet Union were very close allies. If you looked at the history of US-Soviet relations in the 1930s, and you looked at the Cold War, you would have had no idea you didn't know what happened in World War II, that the United States and the Soviet Union fought together rather closely against the Soviet Union, against Nazi Germany. But they did. And that's because we had to choose. And we chose to side with the Soviets. Well, here you have a situation where the United States has all sorts of problems with the Russians and has all sorts of problems with the Chinese. But the idea that you would drive the two of them together makes no strategic sense. It's a violation of geopolitics 101. Right? What you do is you swallow your pride if you're the Americans, and you improve your relations with the Russians because the Chinese are a greater threat. But we don't seem to get that, and I don't understand why. And by the way, that's a contradiction of my basic theory. Right? And as I said, if that continued into the future, it would be one of those 25% of cases. Last two questions, please. I'll take this woman Not and this gentleman. Ones. Good evening, and thank you for your question. I have two quick questions. The first one, uh, with the rise of China, could we speak about China as a new uh, uh, rule maker? And uh, uh, how will the international system evaluate if China becomes the main uh, rule shaper and rule maker? Well, on rules, uh, when we talk about rules in international politics, we're basically talking about international institutions 
or what are sometimes called international regimes. Institutions are basically all about rules, rules that prescribe acceptable forms of behavior and rules that proscribe unacceptable forms of behavior. Now, a good realist like me believes that the rules are written by the most powerful states in the system. When the United Nations was created at the end of World War II, it was mainly the United States and the Soviet Union that wrote the rules. Why? Because they were the two most powerful states on the planet. Over the past few decades, China has been a very weak country. The United States has been incredibly powerful, certainly since the end of the Cold War, relative to everybody else in the system. And we have basically written the rules. The Chinese have not played a key role in writing the rules. As China continues to get more and more powerful, it's going to want to rewrite the rules as much as possible to advantage itself. The Americans, not surprisingly, are going to resist. In some cases, the rules will be rewritten. In other cases, the Chinese will create new institutions. To put it in slightly different terms, they will create new rules. You know this Asian investment bank that they've just set up? That's a perfect example of what you're going to get more of. You see the Russians, by the way, working with the Chinese to create certain economic institutions which will insulate them from American pressure. Someone like Putin fully understands that the Americans use these sanctions all the time and they use economic levers. Therefore, you have to create institutions of your own to protect yourself. That logic applies not just to the Putins of the world, it applies to the Xi Jinping's of the world as well. Everybody understands, right, the importance of rules and who writes those rules. Right? So what's going to happen here is as China continues to rise, you're going to see more and more challenges to the rules. And that means that some institutions will change. And furthermore, you'll get new institutions. And then there was a gentleman on your right. Thank you very much for your talk. I would like to ask a very simple question because when I um, listen to your talk, I think you follow a lot of the theory of Hobbes. And um, why don't you come to the same conclusion as Hobbes does? Because Hobbes's conclusion is to um, bring hierarchy into anarchy. And um, you said the only thing to survive an anarchy is to compete and to be stronger. But I would say when you don't like how the table is set, then turn over the table. Because I think a war between China or military competition between China and the US is not in the US interests. So won't it be time for a reform of the United Nations? Yeah. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, his basic question is, isn't my story a lot like Hobbes's story? Uh, and then he develops the, um, the ramifications of that. Uh, let me say a few words. First of all, my story is a great deal like Hobbes's story. Uh, for those of you who haven't read Leviathan, Hobbes's famous book Leviathan, you really should. Uh, it's basically a structural realist story. Uh, I didn't, I really didn't read Hobbes until after I wrote my book, but I remember uh, after reading Hobbes, I mean, I had read him in a very superficial way before I did my uh, work on Tragedy of Great Power Politics. I remember after reading Hobbes, a after I'd written Tragedy of Great Power Politics, after reading Hobbes, I was really struck by uh, the similarities in, in the argument. Um, uh, Hobbes, uh, Hobbes, as you know, in the Leviathan, does not focus on states. He focuses on individuals. Okay, he focuses on individuals. Uh, 
goes back to your question in a very important way, which is a very individual-oriented question. You were focusing on individuals. That's what Hobbes does, and I focus on states, but the story's basically the same. Individuals can't be certain about intentions in Hobbes' story. States can't be certain about intentions in John's story, but a very similar story. Uh, now, there's one other point about Hobbes. Hobbes actually believed that states in the international system are much more secure than individuals in the state of nature. And I, I won't explain the logic behind that unless somebody wants to talk about it later. But the fact is, his view of international politics, state versus state, is actually quite different than mine because he sees the world in more benign terms when he's talking about states. But when he's talking about individuals as he is in the Leviathan, okay, uh, that looks a lot like John's realist world of intense security competition. But you're right. Now, this gentleman said quite correctly that Hobbes' solution to the problems that you face in the state of nature, and by the way, the state of nature is anarchy. Everybody understand that? State of nature is anarchy. It's just another phrase. Individuals in the state of nature are in an anarchic, anarchic environment. As he pointed out, Hobbes' was, Hobbes's solution is to create a state or a commonwealth. That's the social contract. The individuals in the state of nature create a social contract, which is a state. And you go from anarchy to hierarchy. You're happy from then on out. OK? Now. His question is, why can't states, that's his question, why can't states do the same thing? Now, this involves creating a world state. It's not the United Nations. The United Nations is not a world state. The United Nations does not get you out of anarchy. The United Nations goes back to this woman's question about rules and institutions. The United Nations is an institution. It's not a world state. For Hobbes, you've got to create a world state. And Wendt writes about this, getting back to the question from back there before. Right? Wendt talks about the inevitability of a world state. You understand that if you have a world state, if you have a world state, then you transcend anarchy. And by the way, does anybody uh, know, there's this book, uh, I footnote it, by a man named uh, Lowe's Dickinson, G. Lowe's Dickinson. He is the man who invented the term anarchy as it applies to international relations. He wrote a book in 1916 called The European Anarchy. And the basic argument that Dickinson makes is that if we're going to end this security competition, if we're going to end great power war, he was writing in 1916 in the middle of World War I. He was a British scholar. He was a classicist. He said what we have to do is transcend anarchy. He was making basically the argument in Hobbesian terms that we have to get to hierarchy. My response is very simple. We're not going to get a world state. It's never come close to happening. And it's never going to happen. And if you think the United Nations is an instrument that can keep peace in the world and create hierarchy, I think you're just dead wrong. So just I, your pardon? Just drop your veto on Security Council. That would be all. Drop our veto? <laughs> no, no. What you don't understand is that for a world state to be effective, it has to have a monopoly on the means of violence. Do you understand? That's what a state is. That's what the Russian state is. That's what the American state is. Right? You, that, that's what Hobbes understood. Right? You, you, it's, it has nothing to do with a veto in the UN. I, I'm not defending the veto. If, there, if the United States and the, and the Soviet Union didn't have a veto, starting in 1945, there would have been no meaningful United Nations. We would never have agreed. It's, 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 it's controlling the means of violence that really matters here. That's what a world state is all about. But you're not going to get a world state. 
You want to remember, you live, and we have lived for many, many decades now, in the age of nationalism. And nationalism makes it almost impossible to create a world state. Because the Russians don't want a world state, the Americans don't want a world state, Germans don't want a world state, and the Chinese don't want a world state. They all want a state of their own. That means anarchy is, if not forever, at least as far as the eye can see. That means that we're consigned to a Hobbesian world of the sort described in the Leviathan. Okay, let's thank Professor Mishama. Thank you very much for coming, and you're very welcome at our next lectures on Thursday and Friday. Thank you very much. Cool.